here tonight for the second session of Between the Lines. It's a program that brings very talented young writers here to the University of Iowa for a two-week boot camp in writing. And uh, this week we've had been hosting writers from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Kyrgyzstan, and starting on Saturday, the Maldives. Our first reader tonight is Amina Hussein, who was in the International Writing Program Fall Residency about 11 years ago. She's a writer and co-founder of the Pereira Hussein Publishing House in Colombo, Sri Lanka, which has established itself as the front runner for cutting edge Sri Lankan fiction from emerging and established writers. Her novel, The Moon in the Water, was long listed for the Man Asian Literary Award and the Dublin Impact Prize. Her first short story collection, 15, was shortlisted for the Gratian Prize in 1999. And her second collection of short stories, Zillage, won the State Literary Prize in 2005. She's also edited three collections of children's stories and a collection of stories for adults. And she's currently at work on a novel. I also want to say personally that uh, she is one of the most fun people we've ever had in the International Writing Program. And she, I know in her last time here, she gave us a whole new way to think about uh, what a traditional marriage might mean, both in ancient times and in the present. I can't wait to see how she's going to blow our minds tonight. Amina? Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Chris, for that very kind invitation. Uh, my, I woke up this morning with a little bit of a, of a throat, you know, problem. So I hope that everyone can hear me, and that uh, if I'm, if I start fading away, just raise your hand, and I will up the volume. So, I'm going to read a chapter from the novel that I'm working on. And I should put it in context because it's set in a village in Sri Lanka. And it's about an older gentleman. So he's 70 years old. He's relocated from the city to the village. He has a secret he's hiding. And later he kills someone and he becomes a fugitive even from this village. But this is before anything dramatic has happened. And he's telling us about a particular person who has had an impact on him. The title of this is The Hunter Philosopher. It was true that at first I had a problem with the man. In my first year in the village, he left a trap gun on the jungle part of my property. A crude metal bar filled with gunpowder balanced on two Y-shaped sticks the height of a deer. There was a barely visible wire attached to a tree that would trip the gun off, should an unlucky animal, deer, wild boar, monkey come by. A rather crude yet effective contraption. But what was even more unlucky was if some unfortunate soul was to wander by unknowingly and have their leg blown off. The area surrounding Spoonflower was full of these creatures. We had at least four unfortunates who travelled on primitive wheelchairs, eliciting the sympathy of others, mostly the hunters themselves. Now hunting and philosophy are not normally associated with one another. But when I summoned the errant fellow and told him he could very well have blown my leg off, he merely smiled and said, Sir, the gun was not set to go off during the day. To be followed with, we live the way we can. The man got my goat with his insouciant attitude. I sent him off with a few strong words, but he made a terrific impression on me with his stoic and unflappable calm, and if ever I saw him on the road, I would hail him for a few words. One day he came by and offered to trim my trees. Without much ceremony, he laid his cap on the ground, tucked his sarong up and surveyed the tree. It was swarming with fire ants. Placing a finger on his lips indicating I should not speak, he tucked an ant in his mouth and began hauling himself up, his thigh muscles popping with effort. In half an hour he shimmied down and carefully released the ant from his mouth. The ant, he told me, was a chem, a village spell of protection. Smiling benignly at rural superstitions, I pointed out my next job that required his attention. 
He stated no sum for his work and at the end of four hours accepted the notes pressed into his calloused hand with not even a glance at them. He had a small hut set up by the lagoon where he could be found some evenings and on my daily walk if I ever met him I would be invited to chat. I began to look forward to our meetings and took my flask in case of a chance encounter. He provided a chipped glass for myself and a cleaned out coconut shell for himself. After a couple of months, I found myself drinking the same way. I'm not sure if it was the clean air, but I began to enjoy my drink of the evening in that manner with him. I could just imagine my city friends alarmed at my going native. One day after a few shots of Eric, he told me his hut was situated on the grounds of an old cemetery. Many of the previous generation were buried here and he had no problems with them. They left him alone and he them. I looked around. The bare land was full of thorn bushes and shrubs that looked like gauze. A small tree gave his hut some shade, but the sand was white and bleached and looked like nothing else would grow on it. It came across as a perfect place for a cemetery. Naturally, we began to speak of death. I don't know your story, sir, he told me, but you must have led a very different life before you came to our village. You came from a place of noise and chaos. Look at us. You think we are very poor. And it is true, materially, we have nothing. But we have something that you don't have and didn't have before. Perhaps you have it now, but in my experience of city folk, it is harder for them to find it. But there is one thing we all have in common. We will all have to die. Then you and I will be equal. It will not matter one bit that you have what you have and I have nothing will boil down to how we lived our lives. That's all. People like your kind tend to forget that. We swilled our coconut shells and took a sip. It was early in the year and the Milky Way flowed through a fine night sky. A lone waterfowl squawked at a disturbance and the waters of the lagoon smacked now and then on a boat. I wondered if all philosophers in the world were poor. Was it poverty that gave one the philosophical edge? Listen, I told him, you have a house in the village. If you are so content, why did you choose to come to the cemetery? You too must be searching for something, so perhaps you are not all that content as you want me to believe. He pondered my point for a moment, a sip to wet his throat before he began to speak. Perhaps you are right, he said. I have a wife, I have a son and a daughter. They're both grown up and have become fine adults. They give me money for my wife and me, if we need anything more, I will do odd jobs or catch some crabs. We have enough to eat, we have shelter, we don't need many clothes. But one day I had a longing. It was so great and so strong, I could not ignore it. It was a longing for something more. I have never left this village for more than two days. On those days I go on pilgrimage to Thalavilla and Madhu. We live in tents on large tracts of land. We cook together, sit together and gossip in the evenings. We attend the religious ceremonies in the church and listen to the preacher there. We meet others from different parts of the country. We exchange ideas and share views. But there's nothing spiritual or religious about it. It is simply a need for human beings to congregate on a shared basis. In some religions, you have different stages in a person's life. You have the householder's stage, where you fulfill your worldly duties. And then you have the forest stage, where you look for that something more. I am looking for that something more. I was silent. I would have never thought that a philosopher lived amongst us. Soon after, I bid him goodbye and began the, lon the lonely and dangerous walk back to my house. I had a strong torch, which I swung from side to side. The place was infested with poisonous serpents and there were scorpions as large as lobsters in these parts. I remembered the rare times the philosopher has visited me in the night. The man often slips away into the darkness to make his way back into his hut. By the second year we had become good friends and sometimes our conversations would go long into the night. Most times I would go home, but one day having drunk too much and talked too much, he insisted I stay over. I was hesitant. He didn't seem to have any of the basic amenities I was used to, not even a toilet. 
He dragged a reed mat out for me and pla I placed it in an open space under the stars. Eventually I fell asleep watching the show put on by the man above. We woke up to the sound of guns. We saw ground fire aimed upward towards the sky where a black shape hugging the coast made its way northwards. It looked like a crude air device but newly woken from a deep sleep. I couldn't figure what it was. The jungle was to the north of us and I knew a navy camp was based there. Fighting, the, philosoph the philosopher murmured as he turned over and continued to sleep. I felt a tremor of our knees. The country was in the middle of an unending war and even though the village was situated on the borders of conflict, the fighting rarely made its way to us. I must have fallen asleep, for by the time I woke, the sun was high in the sky and the philosopher had disappeared. That evening, he appeared in my house, accompanied by one other. The philosopher never liked to come much to my house. He was a man who was a king in the midst of nature, but take him out of his context and he became reduced to little more than a vagabond, shifty and purposeless. Now he sat on the floor, leaning against a column, and asked me if I heard the news. Last night, right in the middle of an important cricket match, those gutsy buggers had flown two planes into the heart of the city and attacked the capital. Despite their ridiculously crude flying machines, they could not be intercepted by the government forces. I then understood what I had heard and seen the previous night. I realized the war was literally next door to me. The philosopher asked me to give sanctuary to the five Tamil families living in the village. In the heat of the moment, he calmly said, you never know what neighboring villages will do. We need to protect them in case of violence. I agreed, and that night and for the next few nights, around 20 frightened, silent men, women, and children took residence in the lab. The philosopher came visiting every evening. A week later, back at our usual place, he looked me direct in the eye and said, this is what happens to a family. Brothers and sisters fight, children are in the middle, and one day before we know it, the family has broken apart completely. I had no words for him. If only our bloody politicians thought like him. A simple man with no education has more to teach us than all those political wolves put together. Time went on like this. Some weeks we met frequently, other times months would go by before I would catch sight of him. Life in the village goes at the pace of a bullock cart. Things are so far away and take so long to be done that before you know it, you have completed only three things and three months have passed. It looked like it was going to be another year of drought and for the past few months I have been laying down water pipes. The philosopher was far from my mind. One night I woke to the sound of a deer. I lay in bed, tracking its bark. It moved from southeast to northeast, yelping at intervals and in the silence of the night, I was uneasy. It was clear the deer was on my land and there were only two reasons it could be frightened. This was not leopard territory, so it could only be the other. Sure enough, I heard a gunshot and then the night descended into deep silence. I was furious. That old codger was up to his old tricks again. I dressed quickly, wore my gumboots, grabbed my torch, my hunting knife, and off I went. It was madness on my part, but I was cloaked in rage, not thinking clearly. The forested part of the land is not easy to get to. Some years ago, we were hit by a week-long storm. The water holes in our lands, based on the cascade system, mean it is only a matter of time and rain for the water hole at the top of the chain, perhaps situated 10 kilometers away, to burst and for the effects to be felt in a matter of hours, which is what happened. Twenty water holes burst their bands and came crashing through my waterways at the very lowest point of the system. The village said the noise was like a bomb. The destruction was as bad. I had been in the city for a week on work, but came up immediately the next day. The damage was considerable. Everything in the path of the water had been swept away. I lost almost everything then. I foolishly never repaired my neighbor's bund, and since then access to my forest land was difficult. Now there I was, in the dead of night, clambering up and down hostile territory, on the lookout for snakes, scorpions, tarantulas, and who knows what other fearsome creatures that live in these parts. Eventually I scrambled up and began to creep below thorny branches and scrub jungle. 
I heard a moan, then a sound like a large creature thrashing through the bushes. I moved towards the noise. Soon I came across the most pitiful sight of a large stag lying on the ground dying. What irked me was the magnificent creature may have thought I was its murderer, for it struggled intensely when it saw me and then lay still. I have hunted in my days of youth, but today I pursue game hunters rapidly, especially those who try to hunt on my land. Now watching the dead beast lie before me, I was livid. There could only be one man who was responsible for this. I looked around for a tree I could clamber and lodged myself in a crook of a branch to keep watch. The screech of a peacock in my ear heralded the dawn. I was annoyed I had fallen asleep. I looked towards the stag lying dead and couldn't believe my eyes when I saw nothing. I scrambled down swiftly, scraping myself in the process and began to search the area. For a good hour I looked, but except for a few patches of blood that had seeped into the earth, there were no signs of even a body having been dragged away. And I knew it would have taken three men at least to haul the stag away on their shoulders, and three men would have made considerable noise when they came. I just could not understand it. Eventually I gave up and came back home. I was a wreck. A night up in a tree at my advanced age is not the beauty treatment by anybody's prescription. My eyes looked like bags, my arms and legs were scraped, my clothes were muddy, ripped and fit for the bin. I got into bed and slept. I woke up past noon, with my cook anxiously peering into my room, asking if I was ill. I reassured her that I was in no way about to die. It was time to get tough. I needed to show some muscle. I was going to bring the law into this. That philosopher rascal would have got his son and a few friends to take the stag away. I'm sure he was in his hut laughing like a hyena on how he had made an utter ass of me. That afternoon I marched off to the local police station, which even though local was 15 kilometers away. The six policemen lounging about like louts drank themselves reluctantly off a game of cards to listen to my complaint. Fired with anger and irritation, I gabbled off the whole story. They slowed me down and asked me to say intelligently and clearly what happened. But such is our legal system that when they realized I had no evidence of the game meat, no witness of the crime, no solid evidence of culprits, etc., etc., they wanted to charge me for possessing illegal game. Their reasoning went somewhat like the following. You admit yourself you have game on your property. It is illegal to own game. Game should roam freely in the assigned areas. Yours is not an assigned area. Therefore, you're guilty of the crime. It took all I had to persuade them to drop the charge. A few hundred rupees poorer, I left to the tune of their sniggers and laughter. I now had only one other place left to go. Like any desperate man, I went to temple. The head priest escorted me to his inner chambers. I had known the priest for some years now, and I had developed a healthy respect for the man, even though I knew he was not about bending the law or other principles for his benefit. I related my tale. He listened. Eventually he spoke. Sir, he said, you are alone in the world and a man of money. I staunched the protest that sprang to my lips. I needed to hear the solution first and not waste time arguing if I was a man of money or not. He might soon change his mind when he heard of my true situation. So there I sat, grinning like a chimpanzee, sipping too hot tea, waiting for the learned and holy man to spill his bright idea. How many acres is this forested land of yours? Five acres, I muttered. And what do you intend to do with your land? I came out with my grandiose vision of having a home for the wild beasts of God to live in peace and harmony without interference by man. He brushed off my allusions to a divinity of any sort. His proposal was simple. All I had to do was gift those five acres to the temple. He would appoint me guardian of the land for my lifetime, and once I die, temple would own the land outright. Of course he would ensure it would remain a sanctuary for innocent and pure animals for the rest of eternity like I wanted. In the meantime, if anyone should continue to trap wild animals there from now on, as guardian of the land I would be well within my rights to pursue action on them for trespassing and hunting on temple land. The police and the law would have to take action. Temple land was sacred after all. 
The old priest looked like a saint as he sat there sipping his tea. Genius. Yeah. That evening, I went for my usual walk. I debated on what I would do if the philosopher invited me in. Yet I took the precaution of having my hip flask with me. On my way back, I saw the philosopher seated on a log. He motioned me to come join him. He handed me the two coconut shells. I measured our two drinks and we sat there for some time. A sea eagle flew high above us with a sea snake flapping in its claws. The sky was full of homing birds. I heard of your troubles, he said at last. I looked at him incredulously. Some cheek, I thought, but stayed quiet. Do you think everything has its place in the world, he asked me. I nodded silently. More than a god, he said, I believe in some sort of divinity. He gestured towards the dying sunset and said, you can't not when you see such spectacular sights day in and day out. I'm sure you have your own beliefs, sir, even though I don't know what they are. The way I see it is this. People like us, yes, we hunt. We have hunted for generations. We hunt only for meat, never for sport. He looked at me meaningfully. The rules are always made by people who are not like us. We are told we cannot hunt. We are endangering protected species. And yet look at their lifestyles. <coughs> Excuse me. They cut down acres of forest. They pollute our rivers and waterways. They poison our food. They alter the rhythm of nature. And yet the rules are only for us. The philosopher went into his hut and came out after a few minutes. In his hand, he had something wrapped in a cloth which he handed to me. Could I take some water? <coughs> By the way, sir, he said, I've heard of your contract with the priest. I respect your decision. But if you thought I was the devil, now, sir, you will come in contact with the big devil. Good luck. You will need it. From that point on, the philosopher ceased his friendship. There's not a day that has gone by after that when I have regretted my decision. On my return home, I unwrapped the cloth. In it lay a metal rod. It was his gun. Thank you. can't wait to welcome you back to read from the finished novel. It's a pleasure to welcome back Mary Hickman, who is a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where she received an Iowa Arts Fellowship. And then she went on to work at the International Writing Program for us for several years. Her poems have been published in Boston Review, Colorado Review, Jubilat, the Pen American Poetry Series, and elsewhere. <coughs> She's the author of This is the Homeland, which was published by Asata Press in 2015, and teaches creative writing at Nebraska Wesleyan University in Lincoln, Nebraska. I had the good luck to bring Mary to Istanbul and Yerevan a couple of years ago, a year ago, as part of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. And though she was the youngest writer in the group, uh, from the very start she distinguished herself as being the most lively poet and uh, the best traveler. I'm glad that her travels have brought her back to us. Mary Hickman. That was an amazing trip. And so Turkey's been in my thoughts a lot lately. Um, also, I did learn that not all writers make good travelers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so some of us are good armchair travelers. Um, but it was really, it was really fantastic. I'm excited to be back here. Iowa City is an amazing place. So the other night, I went to dinner with a bunch of international writers and ame and we had the best conversation. It was so wonderful. And then I left dinner, was walking in front of Prairie Lights. 
Uh, a man asked me if he could read me a poem. I said, sure, I'm a poet, I love it. And then I, and then I talked to this guy for an hour and a half. He was reciting Leopardi by heart. All kind, it was amazing. You know? And um, that's Iowa City. Like, you, people just want to recite Leopardi to you wherever you go. It's a wonderful <laughs> place. Uh, this week has been fantastic with my students. I also um, taught for the Iowa Young Writers Studio for quite a while. So uh, thank you guys for coming too. Um, it's always my favorite teaching. Uh, I, you are, you, you know, are not so jaded yet that you feel like you have nothing, <laughs> nothing to learn from us. And I have everything to learn from all of you. So it's always really wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna read. I was thinking I would just read from my book that's coming out in the spring, uh, but today in class, one of my students was telling me that every morning he gets up at 4:30 to do yoga. And so we were like, all right, we need a, we need a class yoga routine. Um, I didn't tell you guys this in class, but I actually uh, have a series of yoga poems in here. So I'm gonna uh, read these and you'll all act out the, act out the poses for me now. Um, but I thought I would read a couple of them just because I love the dedication of the getting up every day at 4.30 for the practice of yoga. Um, all right, so a couple of these from this book. Bow figure. Because of my bad headaches, because of my glands, my devotion, because with your image wandering in and out, a bowing figure is a figure led home, inhaled. I'm led from my head to my hasty heels, lying, just a gate. Should it rain, uncover your head to the river, she says. Had your heart been decorated with grasses, had your bean aphid heart been handed to me, your ancestral heart the size of an endive and bent. And I'll just read one more of these. Geese rising. Bring my vid <clears throat> Bring my middle to V isosceles, where I become bees acting like geese wings, really pins, and lock my waist into sky, arias, and more silver, really chalk that charts. Birds ascending in a V of voice, where I strive to be at perfect rights with their aerial beaks. If you will carry me, she says. If you will carry me, the geese repeat, and you should echo. That's about as flexible as I get. <laughs> um, so the poem, the other poems I want to read are from a book that's coming out um, in a, in a few months, and it's. The name of it is Rayfish. It takes the title from a painting. So a lot of the poems are thinking about art and paintings and things like that. I was talking to my students today about memories and about you know, what, it, what are the vivid things that stick with us? What are the things we remember and did they even happen? And there are lots of different, different ideas about that. Um, we had lots of different, different bizarre memories that came up, really amazing things. And so I wanted to read a couple of poems that are about my childhood. Um, I grew up overseas in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and I have a little brother. I don't know how many of you have little brothers. I feel like that's a particular thing to have. Uh, they want to torture you in various ways. So whenever my parents would go out of town and I was in charge of my little brother, he would maim himself in some way. <laughs> um, and so this is a poem about one of those times. Uh, we were living in China, and my Chinese was not very good. We hadn't been living there that long, and so I had to figure out how to get him to the hospital. Shenzhen, too, and Shenzhen's the name of the town we lived in. My brother insists that cracking melon seeds bears relation to speech. The only content has been eaten. Shell empty, no content remains. Live action, then silence, or at the most, echo. We fill bottle after bottle with husks. When we are on our own, carving our names into trunks in the lychee grove, he cuts his hand. The knife slips, slicing his thumb and forefinger. As blood covers his arm, my brother is firework and flag, bright pain and strange happiness. How does one work with chaos as a material for life? I can't predict how the sap of the tree and the blood of the fist will behave. I perch on the branch, touch my heel, grasp my right foot in my left hand, hold cold foot and warm palm and think, now I know myself by heart. Now I know my heart too. The palm shows the measure of the trunk, the trunk the measure of the torso. I distinguish the layers of my fingers. 
I feel areas of pain, plumes of plain. Do you see these living figures, I ask? They are flashes of lightning resembling ideas. They make me understand from there to here. On our way to the hospital, we meet a woman sweeping the street. She picks up a wrapper, spits on it, and presses it to his cut. When she was a child, she says, buying flowers was very bourgeois, but she bought tissue paper and brought it home to make roses. <coughs> Ropes of bright red firecrackers hang the length of the skyscrapers. Lit, they rip across eye and ear with delicate violence. As the smell of gunpowder floats back, the real beauty of the Roman candle, the bottle rocket, or the fire flower is that they fan into new forms. Fingers become petals of paper and flame. All these symbols, paper, gunpowder, pine trees. I hold these elements in my hands and I ignite them to see what may be made. In the hospital, he shakes with pain on the dingy sheets. I curl up at the foot of the bed. If I shift, the mattress exhales a scent like wet earth. I love this flow of sleep that comes down on me like snow as I play dead. I hold his foot to comfort him. His attention stops at the thin part of the world. Linen becomes sand and milk, becomes a caress on the skin of my brother who, by playing dead, becomes all child and enters a new experience of home, the tributary of his sources. The resting child is encircled by the impersonal. To it, he owes his sudden firmness perpetually destroying, perpetually rebuilding. Blood, too, is a tissue. Jie, he mutters, sister. He sucks red ropes back into sleep. <clears throat> so the next poem I'm gonna read is the one that the book's named after, Still Life with Rayfish. Um, and it thinks a lot about the painter Soutin, so you'll hear a lot about him, but you'll hear some other things coming into in a kind of associative vein, um, you know, La Dolce Vita, if anyone's a Fellini fan, that kind of stuff. Still life with rayfish. Soutin attempts to keep the color of his first carcasses fresh with buckets of blood. The neighbors hate the stench and the flies, but he continues to pour blood over the bodies until he is ordered by the police to stop. Only then does he use formaldehyde. He isn't preserving the flesh, just refreshing it, maintaining the life color of the carcass and painting that blood as lush. He is not emulating and there is no reminiscence. When Soutine's last privately owned carcass painting, Le Boeuf Ecorche, was auctioned recently, the seller expected to get something like seven to eight million dollars. In the catalog description, Christie's lingers over Soutine's early intense poverty and the sudden relief of that poverty when he sold a large number of paintings to a banker. Le Boeuf Ecorche represents a point at which Soutine could afford to buy whole beef sides just to look at rather than eat. Le Boeuf sold for $14 million, which I find depressing, or it misses the point. If anyone blends the line between still life and portrait, it's Soutine. The still life reflects portraiture without any deliberate reminiscence. Soutine's brothers beat him mercilessly. Their cruelty became a ritual. One day, when Soutine was 16, he approached a pious Jew to ask him to pose for a portrait. The next day, this man's son and his friends beat Soutine. It was a week before he walked again. Why is this story retold so often? I don't think I create heroes in my portraits in the conventional romantic or poetic sense. Soutine fights against the monsters. He fights against neuroticism and fear. His portrait can be made in many ways, but always the same image. Sometimes, in fact, I make the same portrait. Say, still life with rayfish. It could have been a fairy tale. My way of making a fable from the portrait is my way of telling it. I simply told it as I did. But our hero is really there, the one in the portrait who possesses the feel of his own life. This is part of Soutine's process also, to see the forbidden thing and to paint it, to severely constrict his subject within the frame and enclose space. He imprisons the image within the image. In Chardin's rayfish, the ray at rest has become a ghost already, nearly translucent at the mouth and eyes. In Still Life with Rayfish, Soutine attempts a portrait of Chardin. This ray rises howling from the table, its membranous belly shuddering, its entrails glow with warmth. Today you will eat dead things and make them into something living. But when you will be in light, what will you do then? For then you become two instead of one. And when you become two, what will you do then? 
Do I mean that in all our portraits we tell the same story? But I can't say I have a special direction, although I feel a certain evolution in myself in the ways I find of saying things. Let's call this a transition from attention to grace. When Soutine works in serial, painting the same object again and again, the paintings convulse. Seen side by side, their convulsions evoke sensation. I see great possibilities by shifting the wings, moving the feathers or necks. Swirling, lacerated flesh swells against blue or green backgrounds. The figure of the bird, whirling foul of penitence, beats even as darker backdrops threaten to swallow it. The body which depends upon a body is unfortunate, and the soul which depends upon these two is unfortunate. In this first portrait of the ray fish, the ray is pulled up by its wings, each wing pierced with wire, hung from the stone wall behind. Or the next ray hovers over the table ascending. It swoops midair. Soutine presents the butchered animal opened, taken to pieces, bloody, glistening, shimmering, yet conspicuously dead. I devour a skin that is grotesque with demonic aura, the terror and humor of its textures. I paint a skin made from sheer white curtains, blowing at windows in stark sun. I make a figure from gray feathers stuck to my neck with sweat. I build whole visions of life out of the swirling black velvet of a woman's dress as she wades into water. That wet velvet billows, a second skin, sensual, dragging her under, pulling her out to sea. In La Dolce Vita, the soft, dark flesh of the monstrous ray is bound tightly by the fisherman's net as the ray is hauled onto the beach. You will make a million with this fish. It's alive. It's been dead three days. Rolled onto its back, its mouth pulls open, and one black eye stares back. Its slick surface resembles the protoplasmic source of all things. It insists on looking. The guardian angel of Adrian Lyne's Jacob's Ladder quotes Meister Eckhart to the dying Jacob. Eckhart saw hell too. He said, the only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of your life your memories, your attachments. They burn them all away. But they're not punishing you, he said. They're freeing your soul. If you've made peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. I imagine the nets around the rayfish as sutures pulled from its flesh, releasing the wings to unfold. I picture the scarred eyes of the surgeon's attendant in Jacob's ladder as two layers of flesh folded over, bones and lumps of flesh piled in the hallway, Faces both bacon and badly twisted, lines, body horror technique. The face moves with an alien speed, a filmic sensation of seizure, fit, possession, mutation. He who has known the world has fallen into the body, and he that has fallen into the body, the world is not worthy of him. The ray's blank eye and the attending angel's carved sockets equally terrify. Soutine's eddies in oil capture the ray's flesh. He structures my seeing. He imparts vision. I pamper this slight ghost. I encourage it. It takes shape slowly. It takes possession. Once I saw the village butcher slice the neck of a bird and drain the blood out of it. I wanted to cry out, but his joyful expression caught the sound in my throat. Soutine pats his throat and continues. This cry, I always feel it there. When, as a child, I drew a crude portrait of my professor, I tried to rid myself of this cry, but in vain. When I painted the beef carcass, it was still this cry that I wanted to liberate. I have still not succeeded. That's kind of a bloody poem for a hot summer afternoon, right? I actually, um, you know, I when I wrote that poem, it didn't start with the blood being poured over the carcass. That was further down. And then my brilliant friend Robin Schiff said, she gave me this advice, always start with the blood. <laughs> Um, so, I, I doused you immediately with the blood. This next poem, um, we, you know, we've been talking a little bit in our, in our writing sessions about trauma, about early memories, about how trauma affects early memories, about war and what it is to have these memories of war at a young age. A lot of people from the different countries, um, you know, and, and even what Amina's saying about what it is like to live in a country that's been at war for how long? 26 years, constant war. Um, how that affects the way that, that we think or feel um, and our memories, what comes through, what sensations. This poem is called Beijing. I lived in China during the Tiananmen Square massacre and um, it, was, it was very brutal and 
um, I lost people that I loved in it and um, I always wanted to write about it but I never knew I never knew what that would mean because it's hard to recover something like that um, so I, I tried this and I think that one of the ways in for me was to just start with the memory, the visuals. What did I remember? What did it look to me at a young age to be seeing all of this happening? And so, Beijing. When the violence began, it was less like violence and more like parades. Students flooded the streets with bodies, horns, a hysterical mass surging forward, black and red banners pierced with holes, bodies stumbling as if hallucinating or asleep. And I wanna say I am unable to write this. Or I want to say that there are two Chinas and I can recover each with ease. I sometimes introduce myself as my child self, or to write a bio, I'd start with hi I'd <clears throat> pardon me. Or to write a bio, I'd start with childhood. I was raised in China and sent to boarding school in Taiwan. So much about past and present is absent in this. What does China have to do with this portrait, this moment? I tell myself, stop looking, or Look into the water, see the Medusas self-coupling in wet concrete. Evading house arrest, we fled. Boarded a plane headed south. It was rare to travel by plane in China then, but the trains had stopped moving. Students lay across the tracks. The government ordered conductors to drive on, but the conductors said, these are our children. I've lived alone all my life, but I never became lonely. I thought I was lucky. Things happen when you're alone. What I make myself consider before the image will appear is that there are two images. Even now, when a surgeon puts his hand through a woman's breast, or I smell the burning face peel back, reveal youth, I think of it. It's fantastic what people think they want. I want 22 rooms filled with 22 paintings and to run room to room, staunching the flow of paint. There's no work that survives and I worry that I've touched the flesh, contaminated the space. The day the Secret Service arrived, I had just started a home perm and tied my head in plastic. One agent searched the apartment while another forced me to sit on the floor. He refused to let me rinse my hair and it melted to brown jelly. Have I manipulated a body into the form of the body I have known? I will the body solvent. And when I look again, my appearance has changed. I have rid the curtains, the things keeping me from seeing. I have rid the things I oppose. I hate a homely atmosphere. I want to isolate the body away from interior and home, which is its knownness. Envisioning a face still young, I see red hair splayed on the pillow, an image of a childhood that, infinite, dissolves wordlessly out of memory. Here are the plates, the etchings that happen. I can blink my eyes, turn my head slightly, then I realize I've turned toward precise desire, a coagulation of color, of oil, the China we left behind in Beijing is a world we could not imagine until it arrived. And here is the China I have made into memory, cutting, layering, all the alterations I made to the first image flatten into a reflective plate. An apricot chin, the shine of a jelly cheek, flesh is so close to paint, and graphs melt in heat. Is she a specific person? Is she related to a specific body? We want to know. And in the photo, of course, we have unsettled her. So the, the, the book is a mix of the autobiographical and the ekphrastic, or a kind of consideration of different works of art and what those works, the effect they have on me, how they've become a part of my own biography by my interactions with them. There's a sculptor um, who died young. Her name was Eva Hess. I don't know, has anyone ever seen any of her work? She was a minimalist, yeah, some people. If you've seen it, you remember, she's phenomenal. She's a minimalist, but a, a maximal minimalist, if that makes any sense. Um, the, the sculptures are really beautiful, but she was using different kinds of resins and polymers and things before they knew that the fumes were toxic, and she ended up with a brain tumor and died very young because of it. Um, and so this is a poem I wrote thinking about her work and about this kind of intensity um, of commitment that happened in this very short span of time that, that gave us all of this work. But of course, all these poems, you can tell, are somewhat obsessed with the body. I used to assist with surgeries. You'll hear some of that, too. Eva Hess. I have to be strict with myself. I want to say fluency or ecstatic grammars. But I try not to be swayed by fiberglass, 
cylindric columns, inflating and deflating, iron mesh that trails cords and petals across the floor, resin, vellum, wax, they are translucent, skin-like. In sunlight, the sculptures warm and glow. They take on the look of light penetrating the thinner parts of our bodies, ears or hands. She conjures life and it is formal. That's why I think I might be so good, she says. I have no fear, I take risks. I have the most openness about my art. My attitude is most open. It's total freedom and the will to work. Eva Hess had a stepmother named Eva Hess who had a brain tumor two years before Eva. She got out of the hospital two years to the day Eva went in. The same hospital, same doctor, in three years, two people unrelated but with the same name. Well, the story goes on. In this work, she ties the frame like a hospital bandage, as if someone has broken an arm. A rigid umbilical surrounds the frame. It is composed of malleable metal. Could it expose a body? We want to know what went wrong in the cellular, the microscopic parts, in the lipids and tissues. Out of domestic reflexes, my body surrounds itself. But the body ultimately stays what it is, combines of organ, bone, tube. It resists all sense. The first sculpture resembles dried intestines pulled through wall. Cat gut used to string instruments will last 2,000 years and carry a fresher song. It's very moving, visceral of course, but restrained. As vellum's dried hide insists that it is time to consider its shape, the shape itself decays. Several of Eva's sculptures have deteriorated. They are no longer their original selves. They cannot be handled or installed as before. Consider a sculpture that, when first made, is softly draped, understated, organic, erotic, like the meninges, the protective tissue just under the skull, and is now a rigid, tawny heap. Maybe what I really want is a round table discussion about conservation. If you cut out a sizable cube of brain, it retains shape, more or less. We see the pattern develop. She only had a few hours left to live. There was so much pressure. The whole brain tipped over and all the intelligence is in the front. I'd like to try a casting material that will last. So many of Eva's raw materials are casting materials, but why think about them as casting materials? Imagine instead she makes the sculpture directly at the moment from each pliant or resistant shell. Although it's fragile, all Eva's work is tactile. The work has momentum. In vinculum, everything is tenuous, knotted loosely, and can change. And I don't mind that within reason. The work holds its tension even as the sculpture flexes, moves, and pours itself back into water. It is a life, but of the most bizarre kind. Does it cry or grieve? Does it sting? Does it lie? Non-organic, but place your hand upon its hide and feel the waters riot. Witness ecstatic grammars, fluent hands, and a breaking, strong current and waves.